Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, we're lucky enough to have uh, Oliver Hartwich, who is the Executive Director of the New Zealand Initiative. Uh, good evening, Oliver. Hi, Chris. Uh, so before joining the initiative, he was a research fellow at the Centre for Independent Studies in Sydney, the Chief Economist uh, at Policy Exchange in London, and advisor in the UK House of Lords. Uh, Oliver holds a master's degree in economics and business administration and a PhD in law from uh, Bochum University in, in Germany. Uh, now, a lot of you will be property investors and looking at uh, Oliver's uh, bio, I do note that he's co-authored several reports on housing and, and planning policy uh, in different countries, and he actually won a um, a report for the at the British Think Tank Awards way back in 2005 uh, in regards to unaffordable housing. So he's looked at the housing markets in a number of different countries. Uh, so tonight we're going to basically kind of get stuck into into last week's budget, uh, kind of obviously get Oliver's um, opinions on on different things there, and have a, a different talk, I suppose, a talk and, and subjects around things like finance uh, stability as well. So the big topic, I suppose, at the moment is inflation. And I suppose digging into that, uh, I noticed that the Taxpayers' Union did a poll uh, which showed that more than four to one uh, New Zealanders opposed government in increasing spending uh, in last week's budget. Uh, obviously, Treasury recommended against uh, the government's cost of living payments for, for middle income earners. Um, and obviously, Grant Robinson basically still moved ahead with basically pushing this through. And I note uh, Stephen Joyce, the, the previous finance minister under the national government, came out with a, an article in the weekend and just quickly to read a few lines of, of that. Uh, to believe that Robertson will restrain himself to a new budget spend next year, an election year of two and a half billion, which is all he has left after pre-booking the health budget, if you believe that you have to be a special type of gullible. This is the same Grant Robertson who told his budget time last year he would only spend 1.8 billion more this year, which has now turned into $9 billion. It's also the same Grant Robinson that is now spending $23 billion more over four years than he told us just six months ago. By far, the biggest immediate concern about this budget is its impact on infl inflation. Uh, new spending of this magnitude will do nothing to dampen inflationary expectations and will likely make them worse. There is absolutely nothing here which will give the Reserve Bank pause on its trajectory of swiftly raising interest rates, squeezing Kiwi mortgage holders further and making a recession next year more likely. This is reckless fiscal management. So, Oliver, I suppose, how concerned are you uh, after the budget last week about, about what, you know, what you saw? Well, I'm just as concerned as Stephen Joyce. And in fact, um, Stephen and I, we emailed him over the weekend and I congratulated him on his article because I think it was actually the best bit of commentary we have seen on the budget. I think the media have actually not done their job this time because the figures actually that Stephen mentioned are extraordinary. And yet, when you listen to the commentary, on TV, when you read most media commentary in a, or major newspapers, you wouldn't have got an idea actually of how extraordinary these figures are. We focused on some sideshows. We focused on the inflation payment of $350 over three months, when in fact that's just a drop in the bucket, really. The big story here is we've got a government that is really increasing spending even more rapidly than we thought before the budget. I mean, before that, we were talking about maybe a $6 billion budget allowance. I mean, Mind you, that in itself is big enough, but it's now 9.6 billion after the budget. And actually, we're talking about $38 billion of extra spending for the next four years. And as you mentioned before, Chris, that's more than double um, what we previously expected. Some other figures from the budget are um, quite interesting. Actually, we're now expecting debt, a peak, uh, uh, debt to peak at $173 billion or roughly 41% of GDP. Now, that doesn't sound much by European standards or American standards, but by New Zealand standards, this is massive because a few years ago, we had practically no net debt in the country. Now we're approaching 41%. This is too much for a small economy like New Zealand, dependent on international markets for financing. And it's certainly too much for an economy that is also at a threat of natural disasters quite, re quite often. And uh, we cannot afford to get into a natural disaster with 41% data GDP. We all probably remember how that played out on the fiscal side with Christchurch. Um, we think this is too high. And perhaps most worrying of all is actually that with all of the spending, we are increasing the share of government in the economy. We are now going towards 40%. That used to be around 35 and we all know that when government grows, actually it crowds out economic activity from the private sector. So actually our growth for prospects have deteriorated because of the budget too. But the other thing I'd say about the budget is actually um, the wrong kind of budget in the economic circumstances we're in. 
So what you see with this budget is actually we have a government with a foot firmly on the accelerator because it is still providing a lot more fiscal stimulus to an economy that is already overheated. And it is doing that at a time that the Reserve Bank is actually trying to get this overheating reversed and trying to withdraw stimulus. Perhaps not enough, I would say. But still, we have now the Reserve Bank actually trying to put its foot on the brake while the government is still on the accelerator. That can't work. We should talk a bit about monetary policy just to put it into context, because actually when you look at uh, monetary policy in New Zealand, basically since 2009, We've been on the um, uh, stimulus side on monetary policy. It was only a very brief period around 2015 when interest rates in New Zealand were roughly where they should have been in a neutral policy setting for every other year since 2009, according to the RBNZ's February uh, monetary policy report, um, we've been on the stimulus side. And so the Reserve Bank has unfortunately overstimulated the economy for more than a decade, and it has certainly overstimulated the economy in these last COVID years. So we've had a QE program, quantitative easing, so in uh, normal terms, money printing, of $100 billion, which was $20,000 per person in New Zealand. The Reserve Bank went a little bit more than halfway through this QE program and then realized that it had overdone it and stopped it. Still, by that time, it was too late because we had completely overstimulated the economy. We have overheated the housing market. We have overheated the labor market. And... Now that the Reserve Bank is trying to withdraw that stimulus, it's realizing losses, of course, on all the assets it's purchased. I mean, most people don't realize it, actually, but the Reserve Bank was indemnified by the Minister of Finance for all the losses it incurs from the QE program. And these losses are now standing at above $8 billion. So this is money that the Reserve Bank doesn't actually have to pay itself. It's taxpayers actually paying the Reserve Bank for all the losses it had previously incurred. And by the way, if they didn't have the indemnity from the government, uh, the Reserve Bank would now be technically insolvent because um, it is more than the capital actually in the Reserve Bank. And um, had it not been for the indemnity, the Reserve Bank would now be insolvent to the tune of about 6% of its balance sheet. So that's not quite um, a successful monetary policy, I would say. I would also say that, of course, for the last couple of years, before we got into the current crisis mode, We've been effectively in some sort of Keynesian liquidity trap where um, was, interest rates were so low that people were not actually spending the money and were basically keeping it, apart from the money that went into the, labor, uh, into the um, property market. Um, but what we've seen since, actually, is we have seen a reversal of that. And now the money, all the money that was printed that didn't actually go into circulation before is now rushing into the economy, and that's causing the inflation we are seeing. To also say something else about it, I think we've had a misdiagnosis of the problem. So when COVID happened, um, the Reserve Bank and Treasury both believed this was some kind of demand side issue, and therefore we had to stimulate the economy to kind of revive it. What they realized a little bit later, and I think probably too late, was that actually we were talking about a supply side issue because we had some real supply side uh, constraints. And therefore, if you just stimulate demand, all you get in the end is price uh, inflation. And that's exactly where we are today. And one final word about the Reserve Bank. I think it's also taking its eyes off the ball. We gave it a new target, a dual mandate to look into not just price stability as it traditionally used to do, but also a mandate now to look into full sustainable employment. And I think the Reserve Bank, because of that mandate, has always erred on the side of stimulus and overstimulated the economy. On top of all of that, of course, we have also witnessed a Reserve Bank that has grown a lot since Adrian Orr became governor. So three years ago, the Reserve Bank employed about 280 full-time equivalent staff. The figure today is 410. Now, <clears throat> that would have been okay if they had hired an extra 130 economists, but they haven't. So basically what we have seen is the Reserve Bank now venturing into all sorts of different policy areas from climate change to indigenous affairs and the Maori economy, but actually keep losing track actually of its main task, which is price stability. If you look into the last any report the Reserve Bank published in October last year, you see 45 times the word climate mentioned and only 15 times the word inflation. And that gives you a bit of an indication of the priorities of the Reserve Bank. When we've got a Reserve Bank that at the beginning of a global stagflation period talks about climate change 45 times in its annual report, but only 15 times about inflation, you can see that something is a little bit wrong. So let's talk a bit about in inflation and stagflation. Actually, Mohamed El Arian, the Alliance uh, chief economist. Jump in quickly from, just on the, on the, yes, on the Reserve Bank there, because... Yeah. I think anyone who was close to the to the property market in uh, 2020. So we came out of lockdown in 2020, and the market was going gangbusters pretty much immediately. 
And besides, I suppose, the QE policy, we saw the Reserve Bank governor pretty much like discuss taking the OCR negative, you know, right towards, you know, he kept discussing it. I think he got the banks to actually put their systems in place so that they could actually move ahead with it and was continuing yes. to talk about it right up to the back end of 2020. Uh, obviously, we, we kicked off last year and they still implemented the, the financial stability report, which uh, kicked off all these, these really cheap build loans through uh, ASB and ANZ, when at that stage, the property market was going completely gangbusters. Um, yep. Any idea why they continue to push these these things through when it was pretty obvious by that stage that the economy wasn't eating it? Well, I published a paper together with my colleague Eric Crampton and with Professor Robert McCulloch of the Auckland Business School in August or September 2019, I think it was. And it was after a time when um, Adrian Orr had already talked about negative interest rates, when he talked about QE. And that, mind you, that was before COVID, of course. And we call this paper the Unreserved Bank, and uh, you can find it on our website. And we argued, actually, that it was irresponsible to talk the economy into negative interest rates when we don't need them. Because actually, at the time, the economy was still growing modestly, around 2 2.5%, and we didn't see any reason or any justification for any further monetary stimulus. So we thought it was irresponsible of Adrian Orr to actually talk us into this kind of uncharted territory of monetary stimulus and um, unorthodox monetary policy. My suspicion at the time was that Adrian Orr wanted to have these negative interest rates and wanted to have QE because it allowed him to play politics. Um, he encouraged, if you remember, Grant Robertson back in 2019 to spend more on infrastructure, for example, and he actually tried to not just do monetary policy, but do fiscal policy as, as well. Now, as soon as you go into this unorthodox monetary policy, if you allow the Reserve Bank to do QE, what it effectively does, it, it turns the Reserve Bank governor into a secondary finance minister, because then it is for the Reserve Bank governor to decide what kind of papers to buy. So if he cannot spend taxpayers' money directly, at least he can print the money and buy bonds of infrastructure projects, for example, that he would like to see implemented or for some kind of climate change projects that he would like to support. So I suspect that actually it was that kind of motivation that got Adrian Orr into talking about unorthodox monetary policy in 2019. And mind you, he comes from a fund management background. He was running the super fund before. So effectively, um, and there was some speculation at the time, it would have turned the Reserve Bank into a secondary super fund as well. So he would have been a fund manager actually purchasing all sorts of paper. Um, and I thought at the time this was just irresponsible. You should just focus on monetary stability and inflation. So um, this development of the Reserve Bank towards unorthodox measures and unorthodox policies and policy stances and actually interfering with elected politicians, this precedes COVID. This started way before, probably around 2019, maybe even earlier. Um, I note... Um... Uh, Robert McCulloch, who you wrote that uh, paper with, I was reading an article of his a few weeks ago and just quoting a few lines from uh, from that. He said, those having trouble paying back their mortgages in the next few years can blame our uh, Reserve Bank governor and finance minister. They encouraged the borrowing bins to buy houses at wildly inflated prices, financed by dirt cheap credits, turning a blind eye to the breach of the target, to which they mutually agreed and not learning the lessons of the GFC in 2008. The Reserve Bank was once lauded around the world for making New Zealand exceptional, pioneered inflation targeting, we became the gold standard of monetary credibility. Now our hard-fought success and huge reputation built up over 30 years lies in ruins. And obviously uh, tomorrow we've got pretty much guaranteed, I think, what, 50, 50 basis point rise, I'd say, we're going into tomorrow? Yeah. That's pretty much on the, on, on, yes. on the back of that. Yeah, and yeah. I note that um, obviously kind of trying to pick uh, the, the, the peaks of interest rate cycles is hard, but I note that now a lot of economists are expecting that we're going to have maybe another 200 basis points. Uh, at least to probably try and kind of get this thing under control. Uh, Kiwi Bank economists came out today and said that they expect within, say, 12 months, uh, pretty much the whole interest rate band for mortgages. So that's kind of one year fixed right up, kind of starting with a six by some time next year. I mean, how, how high do you think it could go? Hmm. Um, well, first of all, I agree with everything that Robin McCulloch writes on these matters. I think he's one of our best commentators on monetary policy and actually one of the best qualified economists you can find in New Zealand on monetary economics. Um, how high interest rates go? Well, I don't know. Um, and I think, honestly, no economist can predict this at the moment with great certainty. But that they will go higher, I think that's pretty much certain. 
you just have to look at mortgage rates where they currently stand and just put them against inflation rates. So the actual, the current inflation rate is 6.9%. That's the official number. It would have probably been around 7.4, 7.5 had the government not also implemented the fuel duty cut, um, the temporary one, because um, that actually shaved some of the inflation off, maybe half a percent. So if you already talk about, um, say, 7.5% inflation in the last quarter, and it's probably still going up, and we look at, um, for example, the floating ASB mortgage rate of 5.45%, then effective mortgage rates are still negative. And this is not the territory in which we can be in without causing more problems for financial stability further down the track. So the Reserve Bank has to increase um, the OCR quite substantially to correct that imbalance. So we've got a long way to go until we've got um, an OCR and interest rates and mortgage rates um, that will actually be um, commensurate with the situation we're facing inflation-wise. And by the way, there is no other way we have to do this monetary tightening, even though it's unpleasant, because if we don't do that, inflation expectations will build. We'll have um, the dreaded uh, wage price spirals, and the problem will only get worse. So unfortunately, there is no other medicine. We have to do this. And, and leaving off that, uh, you mentioned the word a little bit earlier, stagflation. Um, can you explain stagflation and why we should all be quite concerned about it? Well, stagflation is a concept um, that only got developed and um, occurred in the 1970s. Um, prior to that, we thought, well, this is impossible. You cannot have an economy that at once shows inflation and um, negative growth or at least stagnating growth. Um, previously, we thought either you have an economy um, that is growing and showing inflation or that is not growing and showing price stability. In the 1970s, we got, got both. And um, this was not supposed to happen at least not under Keynesian theory, but now um, that, that happened because of um, some exogenous shocks in the 1970s. We had the oil price crisis and we had to learn to deal with stagflation. Then, of course, after the inflation bit was fought by central bankers like Paul Walker in the 1970s and 80s, we thought, OK, now we had found a, a kind of Goldilocks um, scenario for inflation. It was not too bad, not too high, not too low. It was kind of fine and relatively stable for about 30 years, we are now back in this territory where inflation is once again shooting up. And mind you, um, I think we always had inflation anyway. It just didn't show in consumer prices, it showed in asset prices. But anyway, that's a different matter. So inflation or stagflation means that the economy basically doesn't move. It doesn't have to go into negative. It doesn't have to be a technical recession defined as two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. It could just be an economy that kind of hovers around zero, basically doesn't move much but at the same time shows substantial inflation rates, so inflation rates that go beyond um, the target range of the RBNZ, which is at the moment between 1% and 3%, with 2% as the kind of average over the economic cycle. And I think there is every reason to believe that the world has now entered a period of stagflation. Um, what I would say, though, is that stagflation is different in different countries, and, is, and stagflation exists in different countries for different reasons. And what I mean by that is if you look at Europe, for example, in Europe, you have stagflation that is caused, of course, by the uh, war in Ukraine. So you see, for example, in Germany that um, energy prices are going through the roof because the Germans have to frantically try to find a replacement for their uh, Russian energy supplies. You can also see inflation pressures building up in the UK because the UK is a food importer and we have seen massive increases in global food prices also because of the Ukraine war. So there are some specific factors actually contributing to stagflation experiences in European countries. The situation for New Zealand is quite different, I think, because first of all, we are not importing Russian oil or gas or coal. In fact, um, a lot of our electricity is still hydro. So actually we pr produce our own energy in this country to a large degree, and certainly a larger degree than most Europeans. And also where the Brits, for example, are dealing with food inflation, I mean, New Zealand is still a net exporter of food. We produce food to feed um, about 40, 50 million people. So yes, we're paying a bit more for food, but actually it means that our, um, our um, terms of trade have improved. So actually for the whole of the New Zealand economy, rising food prices might even be a positive in some ways. So then you ask yourself, so why do we still ex experience the same kind of stagflation that other countries are experiencing? And I think if you really look through this now, what you see is on the one hand, we've got government policy that has been for the last four years very anti-growth, um, while still providing a lot of fiscal stimulus for consumption, but actually not creating the um, circumstances under which um, um, any productivity increases would be realized. And then at the same time, we have 
monetary policy led by the RBNZ, um, which has been hugely stimulatory um, with QE, but even before the COVID crisis, um, always going um, in a lower um, OCR direction than um, neutral circumstances would have actually prescribed. And so I think our stagflation is completely homemade. It has nothing to do really with the Ukraine war. And I mean, there are other countries in the world that are actually so far escaping stagflation. I mean, look at Japan. The Japanese inflation rate is currently around 2%. So it's not a given that you have to experience stagflation right now. A lot of it comes down to your own domestic policy settings. And on these policy settings, I think New Zealand has actually got it completely wrong. So we need to do something about that to respond to the stagflation crisis in New Zealand. And if you'd like me to, I can tell you what I would do. I'd love to. Yep. Okay. So first of all, um, the first point would always be monetary tightening. There's absolutely no way of dealing with inflation other than monetary tightening because, I mean, we remember Milton Friedman, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. There is absolutely no escaping from that. You can't gloss over that. You can't just um, hope that everything will um, at some stage return to normal. You have to do something about it. Because we know from experience that once you have inflation expectations built in the market, um, they will spiral. They will become worse every year because people realize, of course, that their money doesn't buy as much as it used to. And therefore, they will demand higher salaries, higher wages, and therefore the whole thing spirals out of control. So you have to actually tighten immediately to take this down. And unfortunately, there is no way for a government to cushion this blow much because um, governments will be tempted, of course, to try to pay people for the extra inflation pressures. You know, winter fuel payments and extra inflation relief like the one we had in the budget last week, $350 over three months. The government will always try to do something like that. But it's impossible to do that without at the same time providing more fiscal stimulus, which will then drive the inflation rate higher again. So unfortunately, the medicine is really bitter, but we have to take it because otherwise we can't deal with it. It would be like uh, prescribing chemotherapy to a, a patient and at the same time administer a drug that counters the, the chemicals that we actually inject to fight the cancer. So unfortunately, there is no way to make this more pleasant. We have to deal with that. What the government should now nevertheless do are some supply side reforms because while we're do dealing with the inflation part of stagflation with monetary tightening, we still have to deal with the stagnation part and try to revive the economy. But that means supply side reforms. And the way I would tackle that is with deregulation. I think it takes way too long to get anything done in this country. It's way too long to get planning permission to build anything. It gets way too long to really deliver any kind of infrastructure. I mean, look at Transmission Valley, how long that took. So we have to get the economy to grow again. And we have to make sure that there are no bureaucratic obstacles in the way to this kind of growth. So that would be my first point, deregulation. The second point would be to keep the labor market flexible. We have to have a very flexible labor market to respond to all the different changes in the economy, and there are plenty of changes at the moment. The problem is we are doing the opposite. We've got a government that wants to introduce fair pay agreements, so basically leading us back to the kind of labor market experience of the 1970s, or actually turning us into an Australian-style award system. Now, this is the opposite of labor market flexibility that we need. And unfortunately, if you're uh, regulating the labor market in that kind of way, you're not creating any growth. Maybe you're creating some growth for union membership, but that's about it. So we have to tackle that. By the way, in a similar way, we have to also do something about social unemployment insurance because that is exactly the wrong proposal at the wrong time. So we have to keep labor markets flexible. And unfortunately, social unemployment insurance is doing the opposite too. My third point on the supply side agenda would be we have to talk about migration. We know that we have actually lost a lot of people and we're losing a lot of people to other countries. And at the same time, we're not getting the specialists and um, people into the country that we need to fill our jobs. We have an overheated labor market and we're making it impossible basically for migrants to fill these jobs. So we have to have a much more proactive migration policy to make sure that New Zealand once again attracts the talent it needs. And my final point on our supply side agenda would be a liberalization of trade and FDI. And New Zealand believes it is a um, free trading nation, but that's not entirely true because if you look at it, we are trading under 30% of GDP. So our imports and our exports are equivalent to just under 30% of GDP. If you look at the most successful nations on this um, planet, for example, Ireland, but also Germany, you can see that they typically trade 50, sometimes 100% of GDP. So 
we are not actually participating enough in global um, labor, um, division of labor. We are not uh, participating enough in global value chains. And related to that, of course, we have made it extremely difficult for international investors to come here. So basically, our um, level of inward um, investment hasn't changed for 20 years, where other countries have actually managed to attract a lot more foreign investment. And you need that foreign investment, not just because you need the capital, but also because you need to link into international value chains and actually take that to lift your productivity. So if I just sum up again, what needs to be done about stagflation? First of all, you fight the inflation part with tight monetary policy, even though it's painful, but there is no other way. But then you try to compensate for that on the supply side with supply side reforms. And that means deregulation. It means free labor markets. It means proactive immigration policy. And it means a much more liberal stance on trade and foreign like investment. This is what I would do. And this is how I would tackle the stagflation crisis in New Zealand. So a couple of quick things off the back of that, if I may. Uh, so mm -hmm. first, if you were to, to happen to, to sit in the uh, the Reserve Bank uh, governor's chair tomorrow, would you only be moving 50 basis points or would you actually go, go harder tomorrow? I would go harder. Yep. I would go harder and I would signal um, that I'm prepared to go even harder. The problem with Adrian Orr is, of course, he has absolutely zero street cred when it comes to price stability. Because for the last three years, he has talked about everything else. He's talked about climate change. He has talked about the Maori economy. He's talked about diversity. He's talked about basically every other policy issue, but not price stability. So unfortunately, Adrian Orr has absolutely no credibility in the markets for delivering price stability, which I think is something that will cost the New Zealand economy dearly. Because when it comes to delivering price stability, Adrian Orr now has to deliver perhaps twice what a normal Reserve Bank governor would have to do because markets simply don't believe him. So I think if we had a Reserve Bank governor with a reputation for delivering um, price stability, it would actually not cost us as much as Adrian Orr now because Adrian doesn't have that credibility. I mean, just imagine you would import someone from a stability-oriented central bank, say the Dutch central bank or the German central bank, and you would install that person as the next RBNZ governor. I think actually just that as a signal would probably be equivalent to 200 basis points on the OCR. Cool. And um, just just if anyone's got questions, if you start throwing them in the Q&A box, well, we will go uh, through those questions with Oliver uh, towards the end. But just back onto your five-point uh, solution there, you also mentioned social insurance. Can I just get you to expand a bit further on that, uh, what the real cost of that's going to be probably for uh, the average employee, but also, I suppose, how you've seen that play out overseas and why we have to be so careful of actually letting a government implement it now? Yes. Um, well, social insurance is a uh, scheme in, 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 in the welfare scheme. It's extremely um, commonplace in many European countries, but New Zealand so far has never had that. So it's a social insurance model where you pay into a social insurance pot um, and it's typically for employers and employees um, jointly paying into this um, to pay for all sorts of um, goodies in the end. So in this case, an unemployment insurance, which covers um, losing your job for um, kind of business reasons, but also paying for you should you lose your job because of health reasons. And the government has toyed with this idea now for um, couple of years and last year and last year's budget they announced that they're going ahead with it and ever since we have received um, some further information from the government on how they see this play out and basically it means an extra three percent of income tax effectively just under three percent extra tax to be paid as a social security contribution into this pot um, this will ev effectively cost the New Zealand economy about three and a half billion dollars a year Unfortunately, I think this is just the beginning because what we have seen also in international experiences that once you introduce such a scheme, it will become more expensive over time because there will always be a political temptation to deal with some political desires through the social security system. That's the experience, um, at least of Germany, where this scheme was actually invented in the 1880s and it has since grown into a beast where ordinary German employees are now paying more social security contributions than they even pay in income tax. So I think this is where we're going with uh, this scheme in New Zealand in the long run. But even in the short term, New Zealand simply doesn't need that scheme because we have relatively low unemployment at the moment. And actually, we've had low unemployment compared to many European countries for the last 20 years. We have also relatively limited long term unemployment. So long term unemployment is defined as people um, unemployed for a year or longer. 
if you look at the New Zealand figures, they're extremely low compared to many European countries, um, really most OECD economies. So I really don't see any reason why we need to introduce this. And the killer reason against introducing such a scheme is that it actually hurts the people we are trying to protect with this. Because the experience is actually, once you have a scheme that pays you for being unemployed, guess what? You stay unemployed for longer. You lose your job and you know that um, you're going to get 80% of your previous salary for the next seven months. Well, you take that because it's quite pleasant actually to stay at home on 80% of your previous salary and not have to work. And so the experience of other countries where they have similar schemes is that people only really start looking for a job once the benefit runs out. And unfortunately, what it then means is that people are becoming less employable over time. And also, prospective employers take this as a signal that maybe there's something wrong with the candidates if they've been unemployed for too long. So unfortunately, we're reducing their earnings potential, their lifetime's earnings potential, because they have lost their jobs, they're staying on this kind of benefit on the insurance payout, and therefore they're harming themselves in the long run, but they don't realize that yet, because they only see that they can get 80% for nothing. So this scheme is just, economically speaking, nuts. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It becomes ridiculously expensive over time. It hurts the people we're trying to protect. And by the way, on top of all of that, we're introducing an extra 3% of income tax effectively at a time yeah. when the economy can seriously not afford this. When we are dealing with an economy that is struggling, when we are dealing with businesses that are struggling, when our costs are going through the roof, when we're dealing with a cost of living crisis, and then we're introducing a 3% tax increase. I mean, you must be mad as a government to introduce such a scheme, but this is where we are. Um, so, so on that, was there any parts of the budget that you did like? Yes, any positive, uh, uh, there was one. There was, yeah, there, there was one bit of the budget that I liked, except I wondered why it was in the budget. It could have been dealt, separate, dealt with separately. And that was uh, the restrictive covenants for supermarkets. So we had the Commerce Commission market study into the retail sector, the grocery retail sector. And what they found was that some supermarkets were engaged in anti-competitive measures. Um, so basically, they had restrictive covenants on their properties. So they didn't even have to own the land anymore to, to prevent any other supermarkets uh, from being built on that, on that land that they previously owned. And um, the supermarkets, after the market study, had already indicated that they are going to um, basically nullify these contracts and um, get out of them. But now the government has uh, also declared in the budget last week that they're going to do it for them. So they're going to legislate under urgency now against these restrictive covenants. I mean, I'm in favor of creating um, a better competitive environment for the retail sector. That makes sense. I just wonder why was it part of the budget? It could have been dealt with separately. And in any case, I really wonder why the government had to do it anyway now that the two big uh, retail chains have actually announced they're going to get rid of these restrictive covenants anyway. And I think they've already done that. So anyway, that was the one thing about the, about the budget that I liked. Apart from that, I think it was really a relatively tone deaf budget because it was trying to show it's a business as usual budget. The government was praising itself for its glorious COVID management, which I don't buy either. Um, when in fact, the situation is completely different. This is not a kind of 2018 type budget, a well-being budget. This should have been a crisis budget, but it wasn't. So I would like to have contrast, I suppose, what Labour threw out with something from the Nets, but um, they've probably been a little bit quiet and I am a bit cynical that maybe they're just uh, gonna stay a bit quiet to let Labour keep falling over themselves. Uh, so as an alternative, obviously David Seymour and, and the ACT Party came out with uh, their, their budget uh, a week or two ago. And you've had a chance to have a bit of a look at that? Yep, sure. Chris, in fairness to the Nets, I mean, one thing we should say is at least the Nets have announced um, a policy of indexing t um, tax thresholds and tax bets. Correct. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And it actually, I think it is scandalous the government hasn't done this, especially when we have inflation at the rates we currently experience, at least, at the very least, we could um, index all the tax bans. But okay, national lease wants 100%. to do that. 100%, yeah. So um, without getting into too much depth with some of the, the ACT policies, just uh, in, in the interest of, I throw a quick uh, yes or no, sure. uh, sorry, if you can just throw back at me a quick yes or no in regards to some of the policies they came out with. And I was watching a, yep. a podcast last night and uh, there was Bryce, Dr. Bryce Edwards on there, I think his name is. And he's more of a left-wing commentator yep. and he actually came out and he thought, he thought their budget was actually quite moderate. He didn't think it was actually uh, that far to the right. But um, in regards to some of the policies, uh, scrapping the rental tax in Brightline? 
Yep, agree. Uh, the policy around paying good teachers more. Yes, but you have to measure, of course, uh, how good the teachers are. Yep. Uh, sharing GST with councils for infrastructure if they can set more houses. How could I not like this policy? This is my idea. I know that. That's why I asked you. <laughs> 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 and you might want to talk about that one uh, in a second, actually, why yeah, it's sure. such a good policy. Uh, gradually increasing the super H. Obviously, this is a contentious issue in New Zealand, but your opinion on it? Makes sense. We're all living longer. We yep. should work longer. And obviously, less, less tax for every unit. Yep, sounds good. I'm with it. So, so get, get, get into uh, Oliver why you think we should uh, work with the councils more, and start and stop centralising uh, everything. Well, first of all, um, New Zealand is among the most centralised countries in the world. About 91% of government spending is controlled by Wellington, um, and since we are in Wellington and since we're dealing with politicians and bureaucrats here on a daily basis, I'm not sure whether Wellington is the best place to decide on these matters. Um, but anyway, more seriously speaking, um, you don't make yourself popular in New Zealand if you're um, making the case for councils, but I try to do that anyway. Um, the problem with our approach to development in New Zealand is actually that we are asking councils to provide infrastructure for new development. So whenever it comes to a new housing development or a new factory or a new office building, whatever it may be, we are asking councils to do a few things at once. We are asking councils to, first of all, talk to the neighbors, make sure that they are going along with it. And we know we've got a problem with nimbyism in this country, so it's not something that actually makes councillors more popular. But we're asking them to do that anyway and deal with the neighborhood and make sure that the um, plants get accepted. Then we're asking them to deliver the infrastructure to make it all work. So we ask them to build some roads, we ask them to lay some pipes and deal with the water issues and the sewage and everything else and provide some community infrastructure as well to accommodate that extra growth. So all of this is costly. It is costly in a political sense because dealing with NIMBYs and um, you know, bananas built absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. It is a politically costly thing to do for councillors. And it is financially costly as well because all of this infrastructure that has to be developed um, and delivered is extremely expensive. So councils, when it comes to development, have to invest a lot. But when it comes to the revenue from new development, councils don't see much of that because all the GST created out of development, all the extra income taxes generated, all the corporate taxes out of that, they end up in Wellington. Okay, councils get a bit of an upgrade in the rates, but actually the rates revenue upgrade that councils get out of this development barely covers um, the costs at all. And therefore, we have two tiers of government, one tier that pays for development and the other tier that gets the upside of development. And then we're surprised that these two tiers don't see eye to eye when it comes to development. And I think that's one of the reasons why New Zealand simply hasn't built enough housing. And my recommendation, actually going back to the research that you quoted earlier that I did in London 17 years ago now, um, is actually that we need to let council participate in the uplift in tax revenue. And uh, I did a lot of international comparative research on that, and I traveled to places like Ireland, to um, Australia, to Switzerland, and to Germany, just to see how their local government systems benefit from extra development or how they don't benefit. And guess what I found? I found that in places like Switzerland, where they have local income taxes, where the councils actually feel the result of their development activities in their pockets, but positively because they get more tax, um, they have a much more proactive council sector and a much more um, proactive council sector willing to engage in development. And so for 17 years now, first in Britain, then in Australia, and now in New Zealand, I've been making the case for tax reform to encourage councils to go for development, or you could say to bribe them into accepting development. And um, I first managed to convince the ACT party, and that's why ACT is campaigning on um, GST sharing from new development, but um, I'm pleased to see that um, since ACT has um, bought into this policy idea, National has done the same. So we've got both major opposition parties now in favor of an incentivization model for council, which I think has the potential of not just delivering more housing, but actually really creating extra economic growth for the economy because we will not just get housing development, we will get new factories, new office buildings and everything because councils will finally benefit from their development decisions. 
Okay, great work. And um, I suppose staying on, on I suppose, X budget, I suppose the most contentious part that came out in the media was X looking to take the, to the, the chainsaw to, to a, n- a number of, I suppose, uh, government departments. Uh, being yep. in Auckland, all I hear probably hear about is, is, is the bloating of, of, of the state, especially down in Wellington. Um, yep. You wrote a, an interesting article probably circa two to three weeks ago where you proposed uh, maybe some potential changes that you could see, see, see two things. Um, you know, is it realistic to, to take a chainsaw and, and I suppose cut a lot of that kind of cost out? And if you also maybe want to explain maybe how you'll go about fixing it as well. Okay. Um, well, first of all, it should be possible because um, just about a few years ago, really when Labour took office, we employed about 47,000 full-time equivalent um, people in the public service. That figure has gone up to 62,000. And I mean, Labour hasn't been in office for that long. So we've had a massive increase in the public service. And I can't see a corresponding increase in the quality of the public services delivered. So I think it is only right to look into the efficiencies of the public service and actually reduce it again, because in some cases, it has grown really um, beyond good and evil. I mean, look at the Reserve Bank as an example, from 280 people um, in 2018 to 410 today and no corresponding increase in the quality of RBNZ decision-making. Or look at the education department. Um, It was about 2,800 people when Labour took office. It's about 3,300, I believe, last time I checked, but it's growing daily. And again, no corresponding increase in the quality of education. Quite the opposite, actually. We have a massive problem in the education um, sector in New Zealand, and we are seeing uh, falling results, falling um, attendance rates, um, falling... um, points in the PISA study, for example, we've got a massive literacy crisis in this country. So actually, we are employing all of these bureaucrats, but we're not getting any bang for our buck. I would change a lot of the things in the public service. But one of the things I would change is actually who they're reporting to, because I think that's one thing that's wrong with it. And by the way, not just wrong in New Zealand, but wrong in Britain as well. And I think it is actually worth paying attention to what's currently happening in British politics to get a feel for what might happen in New Zealand, not so Uh, after a change of government. So in in New Zealand, um, we have, of course, a public service system that we inherited from Britain, and it was supposedly a neutral public service um, that is basically working in a yes minister style with the politicians of the day. And that used to work for a while when, when the public service was still, politically speaking, neutral. Now look at what's happening in Britain. We have, for example, a Home Secretary in Britain, Priti Patel, who is at a constant war with her own department. She hates them, they hate her, they're ignoring her, and she is unable to do anything because her own public servants basically just boycott whatever she tries to do. I think we are going to get into exactly the same trouble here, should we ever have a reforming education minister, for example, because we have this, well, for lack of a better word, this blob sitting in the Ministry of Education They're so stuck in their ways. They've been doing the same stuff for 20, 30 years. If you've got a reforming minister coming in, well, good luck to that minister. They won't get any policies past the ministry. And so we have a public service that basically governs itself and that ignores the politicians. And I would say, actually, the situation in New Zealand is probably even worse than the one in Britain, because in New Zealand, we have also physically separated our political decision makers from the public service. So if you go to Wellington, you will see all of these ministers sitting in this beehive building where they're playing politics all day. They're not sitting in the government departments, of course. In Britain, at least you've got Priti Patel with her office in the home office. In New Zealand, of course, we have physically separated political decision makers from their government departments that they are supposed to to run. So what's happening is actually we have um, bureaucrats, public servants running the departments, and the ministers are effectively functioning as some kind of distant chair. So every now and then the CE of a government department reports to the minister, but actually the minister is so far removed that they wouldn't actually see what's happening on a day-to-day basis. And I think this is just asking for trouble because the ministers in a reforming government, not the one we currently have, I would say, but in a future government would be unable to implement their reform ideas past the public service that is really stuck in their ways. And so what I would do is I would actually try to find inspiration from other countries where they have a different relationship between political decision makers and their departments. The extreme example on that scale would be America, where after every change of administration, you fire a few thousand public servants and replace them with your own people. 
Now that wouldn't work in New Zealand because um, we're simply not large enough. We don't have a place where you can park a few thousand few people for a few years until you've got a change of government again. But there is a different way. And the way I'm thinking about is actually Germany, the country I'm from. Because in Germany, you've got this middle way between the kind of New Zealand or British model and the American model. So when there's a change of government and Germany just had one last year, the incoming minister actually is able to nominate their leadership team. And so a few people get fired. These are the top public servants basically in the department, but the rest stays the same. The rest works pretty much like the old Westminster model in a neutral fashion, but the leadership of the ministry is actually determined by the minister of the day. And by the way, the minister is also the CE. The minister is the chief executive at the top of the ministry, not just the chair, but actually the CEO of the ministry. And that works because everybody in that ministry knows that they have to work towards the minister because the minister is ultimately in charge and really manages the whole place. And the minister, of course, has his or her office in the department itself. So there is no escaping the minister. The minister runs this whole thing. My fear is actually that should we get a change of government next year and Luxon becomes prime minister, Luxon probably still believes this will be some kind of CEO job, like the one that he had at Air New Zealand. And he will quickly find that actually he won't be the CEO of New Zealand Inc. He will be the chair and his ministers will be the chairs of their departments. And therefore, I think the chances of actually implementing any proper policy reforms are quite limited because that is not possible in the system that we currently have with a very politicized public service, with a public service with, with its own ideas. So I think in order to get any reforms done, the first thing we have to do is we have to change the way we run the public service. I think if we're going to remove all these fiefdoms. Cool. Well, um, yes. one uh, final question, I suppose, from me, and then um, we've got a few questions uh, coming in. So if anyone's got questions, start, just start uh, throwing those in the Q&A box. Um, I suppose from someone who invests myself and also arranges money for people, my closest comparison to what I've got going through now is probably the GFC. And, you know, back then, obviously, things got pretty scary. Uh, from a negative point of view, the part that scares me this time is we've got interest rates going up. Back then, we had interest rates going down at a, a rapid rate of knots. On the flip side, I suppose, what we do have is, at least with regulation to an extent, we do have... Uh, things like the, the the loan to value controls that are in place. The, the the Reserve Bank has put some effort into things like the debt to income uh, measures. Um, I suppose back on the LVRs, we saw the the IMF come out. I think last week and say, well, you know, the the Reserve Bank could look at relaxing those if the property market does start to pull back. Um, we have actually started to see some positive changes in regards to the triple CFA regulation that was put on the back end of last year. Um, I haven't seen too much in regards to Labor coming out with actual policy change, but we, they've obviously passed some information on to the banks because there's a lot more common sense than there was three, four months ago. Um, from from your point with having, you know, the pretty much the 90% of the New Zealand mortgage market, or, or, or if not more, as members of the initiative, you'll see and, and talk to um, quite a few people there. Uh, the feedback and what you're seeing is the... Um, the financial stability part, at least, of our financial system in pretty good strength at the moment? I think, actually, from conversations with the members, that we don't have to be too concerned about financial stability. I think uh, the banks are still well capitalised. Um, the Reserve Bank itself actually doesn't really see a systemic risk in that sense. So I think it, it's not another kind of GFC. But in other ways, I think the situation in this crisis is way more dangerous than the GFC, but not on the financial side, on the strategic side. Um, the difference between the GFC and what we're seeing today is actually that we have a lot more um, geostrategic issues at play. Um, obviously, with the war in Ukraine, but also, I mean, just look at what happened around Taiwan yesterday with Joe Biden's remarks. So we have some real geostrategic problems. We are actually in entering a phase of deglobalization. There was something that hadn't really happened to the same degree during the GFC. There was still a globalized world order and still a rules-based world order. And I think that is about to be uninstalled. And you can see this actually um, really in our shipping delays, for example, how long it really takes to get stuff into the country. You can see now also the fracturing of the world financial system after we cut um, the SWIFT ties to Russia. Um, so I think the situation actually, strategically speaking, is way more dangerous than the one we had in the GFC. But I don't see this immediate GFC financial stability risk. I don't see the market meltdown that we experienced back then. I see different risks. Um, but I think uh, these risks 
in a very different field are probably more severe than the ones we faced in 2008. Okay. Well, I'll um, open up to some questions now. Uh, so starting off with uh, Steve, the 2 to 3% extra income tax for the unemployment insurance seems extraordinarily high in terms of its uh, cost only covering only six months. Most income protection insurance policies with two years income protection would be far cheaper than that sort of cost. Uh, there seems to be more to it than a pure insurance model. I guess that it may be more about raising taxes to help cover social security costs that have been growing over time. Do you have any thoughts on this, Oliver? Yes, um, I mean, first of all, um, what I would say to Steve, it, this is not an insurance scheme. I mean, it is called an insurance scheme, but an insurance scheme would actually assess your risks. It would actually look into your profile and then based on your profile, it would say, okay, you're that likely to lose your job and therefore your premium is X. Um, this scheme doesn't do that, of course. What we're seeing in this scheme is um, that everybody will pay the same fee. So in that sense, uh, it will, of course, be a very expensive way of running this because we don't actually assess risks properly. Plus, um, as I said, um, there will be political pressures and political temptations. So politicians will be tempted to dip into this pot and pay for their preferred projects out of this. They will also use this pot to buy votes in upcoming elections. So of course, why, why would we expect such a scheme to deliver insurance at the most efficient rate? Of course we wouldn't because it's a political scheme and like every political scheme, it will over time become a lot more expensive. Fantastic. Um, and so Paul has got here, how far do you anticipate the Auckland property market falling and for how long? Obviously, or you're based in Wellington, but uh, your thoughts on that? I'm not a um, forecaster. I don't have a model for that. Um, my gut feel is that we will probably see it fall quite dramatically once interest rates go up to the level where they need to be in order to combat inflation. But um, really, I don't have a, um, a general equilibrium model that I could put um, the figures into. I can't give it to you. I can only say that the gut feel is actually will be quite a severe correction. Fantastic. Okay, and uh, this is a good one for you. Uh, this is Brett. Uh, so I have one question I can ask Grant Robinson. Well, one second, sorry. I have one question I can ask Grant Robinson at a budget meeting in Palmerston North soon. If you had one question and you wanted to sound semi-smart, what, what would be a great question? Hmm. Ooh, um, the one question I have for Robertson is actually what he is going to do with the Reserve Bank, say, next year, because um, Adrian Orr's term is coming to an end, um, unfortunately, before the election, so that makes it a bit of a political football. Um, it, it, ask Robertson if he regrets changing the mandate of the Reserve Bank. Because that was one of the first things he did as Minister of Finance, um, changing the mandate from price stability to um, also cover employment. Before he even did that, he also gave the Reserve Bank an extra target um, to look into housing affordability, if you remember that one. And then um, Adrian Orr basically ran with that. Ask Robertson if he has any regrets about the changes he made to the Reserve Bank with regards to its mandate. Ask him whether, with all of that in mind, he thinks Adrian Orr is still the right person for the job and um, whether he would not agree with you that it would be better to take somebody else, someone with a track record for delivering monetary stability. Yep, great question. Uh, mortgage sales are low currently, however, with inflation so high and mortgage rates increasing rapidly, do you see an increase in these mortgage sales and what effect could this have on the banks? Um, yes, um, quite possibly. Um, it, it could, we, we could see a rise in these mortgage sales, um, but I think more concerning would be that we could see um, quite a dampening effect on consumption because, I mean, we have a massive correlation between house prices and um, private consumption. I mean, the, the, the question um, about mortgage sales, yep, that's a bit of a concern, but I think the other stuff will happen before. So people will actually feel a wealth effect in their pockets. Um, they will feel less wealthy because of falling property prices. And then we'll see the flip side of what we just experienced in the last few years, where people actually felt good about themselves because their property prices went up and they felt good about their portfolio. And then they went out spending on a new car or a new kitchen or whatever. Now we're going into reverse. So I think um, there will yeah. be quite a dampening effect on economic growth out of falling house prices. Yeah, that part concerns me. Yeah, I remember Cameron Bagri saying that when house prices were going up about 3%, of the appreciation was going straight back into, say, retail spending or, or discretionary expenditure. And so I suppose yep. with I uh, asset right. values coming back at the same time as 
people having less access to discretionary expenditure because interest rates are going up. That, that's sucking a lot of money out of the economy. Yep. Exactly. Uh, Hi, Oliver. Do you see a global food shortage and severe famine in some third world countries and these countries will not, not be able to afford food? Yes, I do. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that really worries me the most about the um, Ukraine war. So Ukraine um, is one of the world's biggest wheat exporters, one of the biggest um, exporters when it comes to sunflower oil. Um, Russia is blockading um, the ports in the Black Sea, and therefore um, they can't get the wheat out. They're frantically trying to find alternative routes. So they're trying to even get um, wheat out of the country um, using the railway lines. But that's, of course, uh, not as efficient as just shipping it would be. Um, we know that there are several countries, especially in the Middle East and Africa, that are heavily dependent on um, Ukrainian food exports. And um, I mean, countries like Lebanon receive more than 80% of their wheat from Ukraine, or used to receive more than 80% of their wheat. So it is a massive nightmare. Uh, remember that the Arab Spring, of course, in 2011 was caused by food um, price increases. So um, this is not just a famine problem, it is actually a, pro a problem also of political stability because we might see actually some countries completely tip over um, because of these inflation pressures. On top of that, um, it's not just the food exports themselves, it's actually the exports of fertilizers. So take Belarus, um, also affected of course by the war. Um, they are one of the world's largest exporters on potash. So as a f fertilizer, we're not getting that stuff out either. To make the situation worse, in a lot of the countries around the world growing wheat, we are currently experiencing drought conditions as well. So that doesn't help either. And on top of that, even the countries still growing stuff um, are reducing their supply because of the rises in fertilizer prices. So all of this together means um, it is a really tough situation for food. Um, and um, actually, at um, a recent conference that Chris attended, I mentioned the one example that I found quite telling, actually, the um, pub in Cologne that has actually stopped serving French fries. Why? Because on a normal day, they used to go through about 120 liters of cooking oil. Well, they can't get it. It's not just that the oil is now more expensive. They can't even find it on the market anymore. So they've actually changed the menu. You can now get um, basically boiled potatoes and all sorts of other things, but no longer French fries. And I found this quite interesting as a symbol of what's happening in markets. When something as ubiquitous as French fries disappears, because something as ubiquitous as cooking oil is no longer available, you know you've got a problem. And that's just a visible sign of the broader disruptions we're seeing in the world economy on food, on fertilizers, on oil, on gas, on coal. Um, it is a mighty, an almighty mess caused by a war between two countries Yep, uh, relatively large countries, but still, in terms of their share in global GDP, you wouldn't expect this to have such a big global impact. But because they are so concentrated in just a few uh, markets, um, it is a massive headache for the world economy. Uh, how can we get the media to challenge more, e.g. Uh, implications of a $6 billion spend? Opinion pieces often sit behind paywalls uh, and most public don't see. Yeah, and some of the opinion places behind paywalls are not even worth reading. Um, that's the other problem. I was actually really disappointed with the budget coverage we got from the mainstream media um, this year. And um, I mean, one example was um, they had a panel of, I think it was Dieter de Boni and um, some sociologist and Shemobil Ikap on news of commenting on the budget. So only Shemobil is nominally an economist, but um, actually he didn't make any sense whatsoever. He criticized um, David Seymour for his speech saying it was economically literate because Seymour had accused the government of increasing inflation pressures by increasing spending. Well, actually, seriously, this is the kind of stuff that you learn in your first year studying economics. So what David Seymour said was exactly the right kind of diagnosis of the problem. And then you've got someone on TV saying this is economically literate. I think it makes you despair about the quality of our media coverage. We didn't really get a proper breakdown of the budget until Stephen Joyce actually published his article in the Herald. And so I sometimes despair. The coverage of basic economic questions in New Zealand is woeful. And the coverage of international affairs when it comes to, for example, things like the food um, crisis that we get out of the, as a result of the Ukraine war, it barely gets covered in our mainstream media here at all. You really have to read international newspapers to really understand what's happening in the world economy, because just reading stuff or the New Zealand Herald or any of the other papers in New Zealand wouldn't even tell you half of the things that you need to know. So what can we do about it? Well, um, 
buy newspaper subscriptions um, to all sorts of international newspapers, inform yourself, subscribe to the New Zealand Initiatives newsletter. I think it's a good source. Um, but seriously speaking, we have a massive problem in this country with the media. And um, I sometimes really despair about the state of economic literacy. Jim Mill, I believe, was the same economist who I think told everyone to rent over the last two years, and we probably know how that worked out. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, Matt said, uh, what happens to housing values with inflation rampant? Will it not flow through as increased cost and therefore high house prices from increased cost eventually? Um, you don't see the um, house prices reflected in the CPI. What you do see is um, rents, of course. So we'll see what happens there. But um, it, it depends on how big the correction is going to be. Um, but I think at this stage, it's really hard to predict. Okay. Uh, given the spending policies of this government and the Reserve Bank's policies, what do you think will be the state of the economy in 18 months' time? I am hoping that things may be bad so this government is voted out, but with the government spending money like crazy, many people might be well off. Yep, um, that could well be, except there are limits to government spending because if the government continues on its current path, it is only a matter of time until we get to double-digit inflation. Um, I am not hopeful at all for the economy because I see this government is doing policies that are going exactly in the opposite direction of the ones that I sketched earlier. So where the government should actually make labor markets flexible, they're making them less flexible with um, fair pay agreements. Um, where the government should actually deregulate the economy to unlock growth potential, it is actually regulating us more on practically every front. Where it should be opening up the market for migrants, um, we see that we are struggling to attract migrants because A, the country is not that attractive anymore, and B, the government has actually signaled to the world that they don't like migrants, so why would they come here? And where we should open the um, economy to foreign direct investment and trade more, but we're not really seeing much on that front either. We get the occasional trade initiative, and that's welcome. But on FDI, the government has actually made it harder in the last couple of years for international investors to come here. So when you put all of that together, um, I'm pretty pessimistic. I think this country is actually going down the wrong path on so many different fronts that I think um, a recession, and a severe recession for that matter, combined with relatively high inflation rates is very likely. On, on our um, international reputation, I suppose you go back a couple of years ago and it looked reasonably good. How much do you think we've damaged that in the last couple of years? Massively, massively. Yeah. I mean, you can see this actually in the lack of interest now in uh, traditional um, migrant markets, if you like, uh, to come here. I heard um, um, the EMA commenting recently that um, there was a particular um, recruitment drive for one company that typically got about 200 applicants from the UK alone in one year. They ran this recruitment drive again this year and got 11. That tells you something. The country is no longer that attractive anymore to migrants. I think our reputation has actually been damaged a lot um, because we were the hermit kingdom. We were shutting our borders. We were not dealing with the world anymore because of COVID. Um, and I think in the meantime, the world has also realized that our house prices are ridiculous, that inflation is out of control, and that a lot of things are going in really, really strange directions here. So you let this run for a few years and the gloss comes off. I mean, initially, um, after the 2017 election, there was still a lot of international goodwill towards a young uh, female attractive prime minister speaking quite a different language from politicians that we hadn't heard before. And there was a lot of novelty factor in all of this. And there was a lot of positive um, um, outward recognition of the country. But we don't see that anymore. It's quite the reverse these days. Yeah, 100%. Uh, can you clarify why inflation did not occur in Japan despite 20 years QE, why there was no gross inflation after QE, after the GFC? Would this answer not identify that the current high inflation is due to COVID supply constraints rather than COVID QE? I think it's actually um, both in the case of New Zealand. We had QE and we had supply constraints. They're coming together. I mean, Japan is a bit of a different case in any case because um, they basically owe the debt to themselves. They don't have to refinance to the same degree in international markets as we do. So I think you cannot completely compare the Japanese experience to what we're experiencing here. What I would say about New Zealand is actually that our um, inflation or a large chunk of our inflation is really homemade because of our QE program, which was simply um, way more than in most other economies around the world. At a time when we had a supply side problem in the market and not a, qu a question of a demand gap. 
So we were treating this last crisis of the last two years basically as a Keynesian style demand gap. And, and therefore we try to stimulate the economy into growing again. When in fact, what we should have re recognized much earlier on was that this is really a supply side shock. It's an exogenous supply side shock. And whenever you've got this kind of exogenous supply side shock and you're trying to de uh, treat it with demand side measures, what all you're creating is the potential of future inflation. And unfortunately, that's what, exactly what we got. Uh, with mortgage rates being more than double and forecasted to, to continue increasing uh, where they were about 12 months ago, Oliver, do you have any concerns that if interest rates continue to rise too rapidly, we might uh, overdo it and need to, to backtrack? Or I suppose is it basically the reserves, you know, their, their mandate is to get inflation under control. It's not, the, it's not their job to keep the country out of recession, is it? Correct. Um, the mandate is to keep inflation under control. The mandate and actually the policy agreement between the Minister of Finance and the governor of the Reserve Bank is actually to deliver one to three percent inflation with two percent as a midpoint over this economic cycle. Um, in the budget last week, um, the government forecast actually inflation to run at above four percent for the next four years. So actually, if the Minister of Finance and the governor took their agreement seriously, they would do something about it now. And I think, um, as I said before, this is not going to be pleasant um, and there will be losers out of this policy and it will be tough on many, many households. But we have to do this now because otherwise the policies we'll have to take later down the track will be even harsher. Is there any way Grant Robinson could interfere anymore? Because obviously going to an election year next year, um, it seems pretty clear if we ramp interest rates, that's going to keep, keep Labour's polling going south. Uh, they're going to want to turn that around some way, aren't they? Yes, they are going to turn it around. And um, I mean, the one thing that commentators agreed on actually was that there was not the big kind of um, headline grabbing policy initiative in the budget this year. So everybody's specu speculating that Robertson might actually do something a lot more eye catching next year. And I think it's something to be um, concerned about because um, that will only exacerbate the problems on the inflation front. Uh, this one, I think, ties into a conversation we had um, prior to starting. Uh, with the complete incompetence that we have in the Beehive, how could you possibly support having the ministers in the Beehive being the uh, chief executives of their ministries? Conceptually, I agree, but these are elected officials based on their individual popularity. There's no criteria around their competencies. Look at Grant Robinson's CV as an example. Doesn't exactly read as a financial expert to lead that ministry. Uh, how does it work overseas in, I think, Germany, you mentioned, where the ministers act as a chief executive? Is there a competency requirement for it to be able to be a minister there? No, nope. uh, there is no competence requirement, and sometimes it shows. But, um, I mean, that's the um, beauty of democracy. You can always kick these politicians out at the next election. But more seriously speaking, I think what's happening is, of course, that you have ministers in charge of their ministries, but, of course, they can employ people working for them. And then it doesn't really matter too much what kind of CV you have, as long as you choose the right kind of advisors. And that's basically what's happening. And there are very experienced public servants in the ministry still working for the minister. And these public servants sometimes are there for decades. Not everybody gets fired, of course. Not everybody gets replaced with political apparatchiks. Um, and ministers actually are able to draw on that expertise, but they are still in charge. I mean, the real point here is that to, we want to make sure that the ministers are actually the ones um, in charge because we have elected them. This is how democracy is supposed to work. You're electing a political government with the idea of actually putting these people in charge. But if we elect a government and then only find that actually they are not making the decisions anyway, it's, it's just the public servants. And by the way, a very politicized public service, a very ideological public service in New Zealand these days, then that's not the kind of idea that we had when we started this democracy. But it also says, if you look at Germany as an example, we had a change of government in Germany at the end of last year. We have some ministers who are relatively young, relatively un inexperienced, and with not too impressive CVs. And I'm thinking especially of um, the foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, former Greens co-leader. She actually fabricated her CV. That was a big scandal in the election campaign. And yet she's doing a really good job now in the Ukraine crisis because she knows what she believes in. Um, she has very clear principles on Ukraine. And I'm certainly not a Greens sympathizer on most occasions, but on this one, actually, I think she's doing a bloody good job. So it's possible. You don't have to have a stellar CV and you can still be an effective minister. Interesting. Uh, does the flip side of the wealth effect show itself more aggressively than when house prices are going up? 
You mean that um, we, we get a higher um, degree of correction now than we had a, um, an increase of consumption on the way up? Is that how I understand the question? I've just lost the question, sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, that one just got deleted. Uh, if that, that person wants to put the question back in, we can have a, a quick read of that again. Uh, one second. Okay. Does the flip side okay. of the wealth effect, so I don't, just don't want a, a, a definition of, of the wealth effect. Well, I think um, experience is actually that the wealth effect works both ways. So people um, feeling wealthier about themselves and... Oh, sorry, uh, I don't understand. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's it actually false. works both ways. Um, and which effect is stronger? I mean, that's a question that you could probably um, check with a bit of econometric research, but I haven't got the figures. Yeah. yeah so I suppose it's the question is more when I mentioned before, um, if it's 3% of expenditure, could there be 5% that we lose on the way down or something like that? Yeah. Uh, you mm -hmm. said, Oliver, that you want to repeal bright line taxes. Why is that? Because I think it is an impediment to the market. Basically, what they were trying to do was um, to introduce a capital gains tax, which they had ruled out. And instead of uh, introducing that capital gains tax, they have now increased the bright line to 10 years. Um, I'm not a fan of these taxes at all, because I think they distort the market. They prevent the market from working properly, because in a normal kind of market, you should actually enable transactions. And um, I think the bright line test does the opposite. And it's, a, it's basically a capital gains tax in drag. Uh, last week, there were 3,500 ships held up in the Shanghai port. Hasn't the global shipping costs delays been a major cause now domestic inflation affecting the supply side of our economy? Yes, of course. Um, I mean, th there are real economy effects and real economy problems. Um, the shipping um, problems, uh, the COVID issues in um, China, the lockdowns in China, they are all real effects. Um, in the same way that the uh, food shortages as a result of the Ukraine war are real effects. But um, they are coupled now with an overhang in monetary policy from years of stimulus. So all of this uh, stimulus for the last 10 years basically went into um, some kind of silos where it basically set because nobody knew what to do with it. We were basically in a Keynesian style demand um, uh, um, uh, trap. Um, well, it was a matter of time until the money actually flowed out of the silos into the economy and started circulating. That was always the problem. I mean, um, we were building up an enormous overhang in money supply, and it didn't materialize in rising CPI rates um, because the money simply didn't circulate. We had a relatively low circulation in the money, um, in, in the monetary economy. And that's something that, for example, Hans Werner Zinn, former president of the EFO Institute, has repeatedly pointed out when people said, well, actually, where's the inflation? We have now created trillions of euros, for example, in the ECB, and actually by some measures about 6 trillion euros of extra um, central bank money in the eurozone since uh, the GFC. So where is all of that? Why, why don't we see massive um, bursts in inflation in the eurozone? And to that, um, economists like Hans Werner Zinn have always said, well, look, the money is created there. It doesn't actually flow. It doesn't circulate. We've got a relatively low um, money velocity. It's just sitting there. It's just waiting for something to trigger it. But once it is triggered, it will flow out and then we will get um, the inflation. So when we look at the question we just heard, um, yes, there are some real economy effects. There are supply chain disruptions. Yes, um, we have this war in Ukraine. But this was really just a trigger, which then encountered all the money sitting there, um, basically since the GFC. And I think that's what, what we're experiencing right now. And just a couple of final questions. Um, so I suppose following on from the, the question around the bright line tax, do you support a broad based capital gains tax? I'm generally not a fan of um, capital gains taxes. And um, I think we can also take the other question together with that. I see there's a question on interest deductibility for property investors. I thought this was always a mistake um, to remove that because basically interest is a cost. And um, if you take a systematic view of the tax system, then you would always um, have the removability for tax purposes of costs. I mean, of course, it's a, like in any other business, you take costs out of the out of your um, profits when it comes to taxation. So I'm not a supporter of either of these policy um, moves, um, either the interest deductibility removal or the potential introduction of a capital gains tax. I'm not a fan of either. 
And I think we'll finish off with this one final question, because I think it is important, as you've mentioned uh, numerous times, you mentioned it earlier, as a country, we're going back with a pretty big rate of knots in regards to numeracy and liter literacy and stuff like this. Uh, so how does one reform the education sector? Is it, is it, a, uh, sorry, is it as a leftist, ideologically driven, unionised organisation where no one can be fired or brought to account? So um, what's your opinions on how we, how we sort out the, the mess that our education sector's in? Well, um, you can find lots of good ideas in the publications of the initiative. Um, we've produced um, more reports on education than practically any other topic over the last 10 years, and you can all find them on our website. What I would say is actually your characterization of the education sector is not um, entirely wrong. Um, I think we've got a problem with a very ideological education sector and especially an ideologically driven ministry of education. When you want to reform education, well, first of all, you need to know where you want to go. Um, I think we've got a problem that we haven't got a proper curriculum in this country. We used to have one, but now the curriculum is basically meaningless and empty. It's about 40 pages A4 for all years of school and all subjects. And we need to define once again what students are supposed to learn at school. So that's the first thing. And that means um, once you define the curriculum, you have to go back to a very knowledge rich um, way of delivering education. So we have to teach the basics well. And then when it comes to the delivery of education in schools, we have to make sure that we actually check on performance. We have to check on the performance of teachers. We have to check on the performance of schools. We've actually developed models at the initiative to do that for schools using the integrated data infrastructure that the government um, has access to. Um, and then the real challenge is actually to get all of these reforms past the ministry. And for that, I think we need the public service reform that I mentioned earlier. and. If you look at perhaps the country with the best reform success over the last decade or so, um, I would point you to England. So in England, after the 2010 election, we had education reforms undertaken under Michael Gove when he was education minister, together with his advisor, Dominic Cummings, who you probably know as advisor to Boris Johnson afterwards. And within two or three years, Gove and Cummings together reformed the way education is delivered in England. They gave it the proper curriculum. They made sure that the schools were actually monitored properly. And you can now see the results in the education surveys, for example, PISA, um, that show a market improvement in education results for England. And I say for England, uh, not for the UK, because education is devolved in the UK. So not all parts of um, the UK um, were covered by Gove's reforms in the parts that were not covered by Gove's reforms. So in Scotland, for example, or Northern Ireland, um, the education um, uh, results haven't improved. But for England, where Gove was responsible, we have seen a market improvement. And so if you want to have some inspiration for your education reforms in New Zealand, this is where I would look. Fantastic. So I think we'll wrap it up there. I want to say a big thank you for, for everyone for, for listening. We'll get a recording out in the, the next day or so. And a uh, massive thank you to, to, to you, Oliver. Um, well, I was uh, enjoyed listening to your speak. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.